Consider the fungus. It is a sort of life so old that it predates any other living organism with more species under its vast umbrella and more of the earth hosting its presence than any other kingdoms of living things. It's an incredibly diverse sort of life form, only somewhat understood by humans and at times mind-boggling both in terms of how it works and what it's capable of. They're overlooked on a daily basis, often regarded only as an inconvenience or an oddity. But those who really know fungi know just how special they really are. But even the most fungus-obsessed super nerds out there might be surprised by one recent revelation. Fungi can be computers. And it turns out they might actually be crazy effective at tasks that classical binary computers struggle to perform. Forget quantum computing. Mushroom computing might be the way of the future. And today are mega projects. We're going to find out why. If you want to find out what's going on in the world these days, you'll probably log on to the World Wide Web. But if you want to find out what's going on in the forest, you're going to need to go to a different source. The so-called Wood Wide Web has been investigated by modern science for the better part of a decade now. And while it's the sort of strange natural phenomenon that just begs to be blown out of proportion, the actual realities of the Wood Wide Web are pretty cool in themselves. The concept in question is a so-called Common Mycorrhizal Network, or CMN. Natural Network of fungus that spread out in filaments through the soil of a given forest. At times, those filaments will connect the roots of trees to each other, and in some cases, they'll connect quite a few root systems to each other all at once. There is a lot about CMNs that we don't know, although that won't stop a hell of a lot of websites from claiming that trees literally talk to each other or something like that. But what does seem to be clear is that these fungi do transfer information to each other, not by any conscious means, of course, but by steering each other toward things like nutrient or chemical deposits in soil. It is a very very, very different form of communication than anything we humans do, but it's quite literally living proof that fungi in the natural world are able to transmit information to each other about their underground ecosystems. Now, as cool of a finding as that is, all by itself, it's also become a jumping off point for a handful of global scientists and researchers to ask a bigger question. Is it possible to harness the information processing power of fungi and turn them to the advantage of humans? There are a few ongoing efforts around the world to try and answer that problem, but the best known among them, and the one we're going to be covering today, is known as the Unconventional Computing Laboratory at the University of the West of England in Bristol. Headed by laboratory director Andrew Adamatsky, the lab at Bristol plays a leading role in fungal computing research. They've been at it for quite a while now. In the early days, Adamatsky and his team were fascinated by the idea of transforming slime molds into devices to both compute and to explore the world around them in a meaningful way. They were drawn to one slime mold in particular. That mold, Physarum polycephalum, turned out to be a hell of an organism when Adamatsky and his team began studying it. They and other slime mold researchers around the world found it to be incredibly adaptable. As Adamatsky and co-authors wrote, the slime mold can solve tasks of computational geometry, image processing, logic, and arithmetics. By presenting data to Physarum polycephum in the form of attracting and repelling stimuli, or that is, a profoundly weird version of binary data that forces the organism to process it in order to go through its life, the Bristol team could make their slime mold problem solve, make decisions, and even store memories, all of which are not the sorts of behaviors that you would expect from the gross stuff that you find in an old takeaway box at the back of the fridge. They were even able to explore the ways in which these slime molds could express their own unique form of creativity, generating novel and useful ideas, and even solving maze problems. Again, this is a slime mold we're talking about. They aren't even proper fungi and they can solve mazes. This is insane. But as the 2010s wore on, the Bristol team began to realize that as awesome as their slime molds were, there was one problem that was going to seriously limit their potential for computing. Because the networks that make up a slime mold are constantly changing, they can't be relied upon to form a stable computing device. Sort of like if neurons forming a network in your brain were always swimming around and changing the structure between them or constantly dying off and being replaced with new neurons in unexpected places. The team needed a new subject for their paper, a proper fungus that mirrored the positive properties of the slime mold but could create a more stable network. Bonus points if they ended up being, say, easier to find, easier to manipulate, or easier to keep alive in laboratory conditions. Before long, 
They had a mushroom that checked all the boxes, a humble little phylum of fungus named Basidiomycota. They are primarily filamentous fungi, and if we may go so far as to say it, they are some pretty freaky looking individuals. Among the more recognizable members of the group are the oyster fungus, the ghost fungus, the anoki fungus, the split gill fungus, and the cordyceps fungus. And yes, that's the cordyceps of The Last of Us fame. But they also appeared to be ideal candidates to form part of a computer. They too transmitted information, this time via electrical activity. They could run computations across their networks, and their fruiting bodies formed an interface. They respond to stimulation with electrical signals similar to those in plants, and they prove to be programmable, albeit with a very different sort of programming that you'd learn in an intro to Java class. At least in theory they could solve all the same geometric problems that the old slime molds could, including, just for the record, the traveling salesman problem, which is the fairly complex task of finding the shortest possible route between a network of points while only visiting each point once. Whether the mycelia, or the slime molds for that matter, understood the idea of a traveling salesman oh, is, thankfully, not very important. Once the candidate, Basidiomycota, had been identified, the next step in the saga of fungal computing was to figure out how to integrate them into computer systems. In this role, as part of a larger machine, a fungus would become a piece of so-called wetware. That's instead of either hardware or software. In general, wetware is any biological component added to a computer system, be they a seed, a virus, a culture of bacteria, or even a brain. And for the most part, they're theoretical. So crossing the gap with a fungus would also constitute one of the first times that wetware where ever had been truly integrated into a computer system at all. And when you look at some of the work that's been done in Bristol, you'll quickly realize that when we say that the mushrooms are added to the computer system, we're not kidding. In the past few years, that particular laboratory has produced actual motherboards with mushrooms growing out of them and mycelia growing inside containers and interfacing with a wide range of electrodes. All this in hopes of incorporating the natural structure of a mushroom into the motherboard or electrical circuit directly. If you take a mushroom, for example, it's important to recognize that the mushroom itself is not the entire fungus. They've also got mycelium attached to them, or that is, a branching sort of web that functions roughly similar to a root system in plants. Those root systems can conduct electrical signals, which can be received and passed along from a non-mushroom source like a computer before being passed along from the mycelium to other mycelia or to the mushroom part. That mushroom is called a fruiting body, and much like an animal brain, the fruiting body of a mushroom can contains enough hardware to send and receive complex electrical signals. These signals allow the fruiting body to be a place where a mushroom can, say, keep data in the form of memory. And just like the slime molds that we discussed before, they should have the ability to engage in complex computing processes that modern binary computers can't handle. These processes are dependent on mushroom cells' ability to transfer electrical signals between each other, similar, again, to how our brain works. And that sort of communication inside the fruiting body of a fungus by cells that aren't just talking to each other in a straight line, but enmeshed into a three-dimensional spiderweb of connections with each other, enables a level of sophistication that is exponentially more complex than what today's computers can do. And like the neurons in a brain, mycelium networks have a lot of other advantages over regular computers. For example, if you take a mycelium and you stimulate it from at least two points, the conductive pathway for electricity to travel between those points gets a lot stronger. Signals can travel faster and be more reliable. Other mycelia have different shapes or structures, enabling them to carry out different tasks. Hypothetically speaking, these sorts of mycelial networks could consume conceivably be built into a fungal imitation of an animal brain, but that's not what the Bristol team or anyone else wants to do with them, at least not yet. For now, the fungi are given a simpler task. Interfacing with the signals sent within modern computer hardware and establishing an ability to communicate in a common language. That language is as simple as electrical pulses. At this point, the team of Bristol and others like it have shown that they can get externally generated electrical signals to interface with a mycelial network, basically zapping the mycelia in a way that makes them talk to each other. They can also get signals out, that is, have the mycelia send electrical pulses to the researchers' electrodes, and for the researchers to be able to take those electrical signals and translate them into something meaningful on a classical computer. The presence of an electrical signal coming from the mycelium translates to one half of a binary language for a computer. The absence of a signal is the other half of the binary. That, all by itself, is the Rosetta Stone connection that allows beings to talk to machines in a common tongue. At this stage, 
The completed loop between fungi and motherboards are not particularly complex, and the goal, as it stands now, is just to keep on providing proof of concept. Don't get us wrong here, there are plenty of limitations to the idea that simply translating electrical pulses into binary data would allow a computer to fully understand what a fungus is telling it. That's the functional equivalence of someone with a 1,000 word vocabulary trying to explain concepts to someone with a 10 word vocabulary. Basically, you end up leaving a lot on the table. But where the fundamentals are concerned, that proof of concept is already there. And now that the bridge has been crossed for organic fungal matter to communicate with electronics, it's a matter of adding new capabilities and making the process work better. Put simply, step one on the path to mushroom computers seems to be complete. So that's at least a rough idea of how a fungal computer could really work. And we do say a very rough idea because unfortunately many of these processes are just far too complex for my teeny brain to understand. Certainly too complex to sum up in a single episode. But what we want to understand now is what a fungal computer might be hypothetically capable of if the technology can be evolved like researchers currently hope. First, there's the advantages in computing itself, and those advantages, all told, are pretty massive. They're able to conduct calculations in parallel to each other, rather than sequentially as in binary computing, meaning that they can not only handle multiple tasks at the same time, but they can do their work significantly faster than current technology is capable of. They could hypothetically be able to handle processes and tasks that current computers can't, everything from image and video processing to simulation or processing of biological systems to potentially even understanding massive, ever-shifting phenomena like the earthly environment or the universe in a much more real, grounded way than modern computers can. They can also evolve, meaning that from an engineering perspective, they could be developed into new and ever-improving sorts of computers with a high degree of flexibility in terms of what you can actually do with them. And and there's all the practical advantages of having a computer literally made of living material. They consume far less energy than a traditional computer and can be disposed of without adding to the immense amount of electrical waste humans generate. After all, they are biodegradable. They can self-repair and recover from issues that would cause system failure, a far cry from laptops and tablets today that can't survive a splash of water. They might even be resilient to electromagnetic pulses, although on that issue the jury's still out. More than anything, fungal computers are special because of how complex and adaptable they could prove to be. If there's one thing modern computers are not, it's flexible. They're unable to morph the way that they work to solve new problems, and they're not able to truly learn in the way that a living being can. Mycelia change all of that. And they've got particular promise when it comes to forming highly evolved neural networks and AI models that could prove exponentially more advanced than anything humans have at their disposal today. And all that isn't to say that fungal computers are an improvement across the board. Much like quantum computers, there are things that they hypothetically wouldn't be able to do very well that traditional computers can. They're also going to need some pretty specific environmental conditions in order to function, a certain humidity, a certain temperature range, all of that stuff. But when we start to examine the the sorts of places that these fungi might eventually show up, their potential value to humanity becomes very hard to ignore. They could end up being invaluable as wearable technology. Imagine them as, say, an ultra-advanced Fitbit that actually understands what's going on inside your body, rather than just taking a few readings and trying to guess the rest. Living fungal apparatuses have been shown to be able to respond to all sorts of physical stimuli coming from a human body, including chemical processes that current wearable technology is incapable of accounting for. That innovation alone would revolutionize the way that humans are able to monitor our own bodies, accommodate and respond to health crises, and much more. Fungal computers can be incorporated into so-called smart building materials and everyday commercial and household technologies at exceptionally low cost and with hardly any environmental impact. Fungi have incredible potential to function as advanced sensors, processing the world around them in a way that no typical electronic sensor could hope to do, and again, surviving all manner of environmental challenges or stimuli that would render a modern sensor sensor inoperable. And of course, there are the other myriad benefits that come from using and mapping a fungal version of a neural network in mycelia, particularly the insight we might gain into being able to communicate directly with brain structures like our own. How far the current work in fungal computing will ultimately lead, it's impossible to know until we get there. Perhaps a future society will become interreliant with fungal symbiotes as people go through their lives, the biotechnological version of the animal sidekick perched on a movie character's shoulder. Perhaps fungal supercomputers will fill entire warehouses with cultivated, interconnected mycelia capable of doing tasks that would require classical supercomputers a hundred times that size. Or perhaps it's all a pipe dream. 
and the hyper-futuristic world we might have a century from now considers mushrooms a quaint little relic for their vegetable gardens. If one thing is for sure, it's that any large-scale adaption of fungal computers will be a lot more complex than a device-for-device -device replacement of the technology we use today. Instead, it will be an incredibly sophisticated fusion of technology with biology, creating something fundamentally different, and with any luck, fundamentally better than even the most stunning technologies that we have today.